Aloha and welcome to Coffee Without Milk, a podcast presented by Maui Institute for Modern Music and Ebb and Flow Arts. More information about upcoming concerts, events, and educational opportunities can be found at www.ebbandflowarts.org. Hello! Hello, Loli. Hello, everyone. We are ready to start another podcast. Oh, great. And Loli. Uh, could you explain how the title, coffee, about, you know, the, the coffee without milk, please? Oh, really? Must, must I explain it again yet another time? Yes, slowly, please. Okay, um, so you're coming in a restaurant, you know, you're um, a customer, and uh, it's after dinner, and uh, you say something. Yes, waiter. Yes, sir. Could I have coffee without cream, please? Oh, I'm sorry, we have no cream. Would you like coffee without milk? <laughs> well, that, that's the joke, you know. Yeah, really, but uh, yeah, it's to say, you know, we're, we're in a position now with staying home and all that where uh, even though we might not wanna do certain things, we, we do have the option not to do them. And uh, right now we don't really have that option. And so it's kind of a frustrating isn't that right, Doctor? Yes, but actually, Loli, I prefer coffee with dairy creamer. Oh, well, we have some of that here. How would you like? Would you like some of that here? Here you go, Doctor. Ah! <laughs> Stop that, Loli. How, well, how about? How about um? How about some garlic powder? No, oh, Loli, stop. How about some old spice? Ah! How about some, um, some more old spice? God, oh, lonely. Well, maybe, maybe add, maybe add some ketchup. Oh, lonely, stop it. Now you've got me all messed up and I must leave. <laughs> oh, well, anyway, uh, that, I guess that taught him, but, uh, please carry on. Thank you very much. <laughs> wow. Wow. Incredible. That was, uh, it took it to the realm of the beyond physical where you actually made, made a mess of things over there, Loli. <laughs> um, welcome to the uh, podcast, everybody. Coffee Without Milk presented by Ebb and Flow Arts and Maui Institute for Modern Music. Uh, today we have two very special guests that have an incredibly long and uh, strong history with Ebb and Flow Arts. Um, I'm going to introduce you in order that I see you on my screen. So on our left, we have Mike Takamoto, and on our right, we have Dr. Bob Wehrman. Um, welcome to the show, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll get into um, what each of you bring to the, to the tables of our lives um, shortly, um, but I wanted to first mention that some of the most important history that I've worked with you in the last... Um, 10 or 11 years has been with our Music of the Spheres Dome presentations, where we create uh, immersive full dome uh, video and music. And Mike, you have created um, art and video. And Bob, you have uh, created incredible music, um, some very emotional and immersive, very loud work, um, which I've always enjoyed. So um, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for being a part of the show today, guys. Um, one thing uh, I also want to mention is that uh, the jokes, the joke about coffee without milk um, mm. started when we began the podcast. It was something that Robert and I tossed around. And it was, it was pretty funny then in an ironic sense. And, and I have to say now, five months in, um, it's lost a bit of its comedic irony. I think <laughs> now, now it seems more like, whew, yeah, that's, that's right. No, we don't. There's no... There's no milk in sight. <laughs> you can't start the show without doing that because everyone expects it. <laughs> well, you know, if you want to see it again and again, luckily you can rewind from the privacy and convenience of your own home. Well, you know, um, James Taylor who said, be careful which songs you make famous, you might have to play them every day. 
<laughs> yeah, that, uh, that reminds me of another tangent, but it has nothing to do with the show. But, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> Maybe but, it'll come up again later. <laughs> uh, this is uh, this collaboration uh, that, that you forged, uh, Mike and Bob, is something we're so proud of and, uh, and, and helped to establish. But it's gone on now for ever since we really started the Music of the Spheres, what, 12, 14 years ago. And it's it's yeah. it's produced something like seven eight works uh, that that are are really very special. It's it's not only the synergy the uh, well you were on at the time a lot on Maui Bob but it, you know basically from Oahu and Mike here uh, on Maui and um, uh, it's this. Uh, you know the, the thing that we we really talk, talk about in our approach to multimedia and our approach to reaching out to artists and composers and so it's uh, it's just um, a very special thing and we're happy to be able to at least let uh, our audience know um, if they haven't seen them uh, in the planetarium well you'll get the 2d version but they're also very interesting that way yeah. yeah, thank you, Robert. Really, um, you know, appreciate all your support that you've given us over the last few years and, um, you know, giving us this venue to uh, share our works with the public. It's you yeah. know, a wonderful opportunity. Wouldn't we we had, without uh, Evan Flo? We, we had a, um, an, a, a very promising possibility that's now on hold at the Maui Ocean Center. The Maui Ocean Center has constructed a state-of-the-art 3D planetarium. They call it the Sphere, appropriately, and we were to have a show there and uh, feature one of your works. Uh, unfortunately, they closed down, and to my knowledge, they have not opened yet. Oh. So it was hard to, we had a grant application towards it, and but it's hard to apply to a foundation without any concrete evidence that there'll be actually be a show. So we're that's on hold. But meanwhile, you've created a work which we won't show here because we want to save it for the actual collection, the collection of works in the time of Corona, we call it. Uh, you've you've uh, created uh, COVID dreams, which is uh, really quite a, Apropos, um, again, wonderful collaboration that you've honed your work down. Uh, it seems to me that that you you've maybe you could talk about process a little bit about how how it all takes place. But um, we're happy to uh, include that work eventually in a probably an online version and then hopefully public performances, including at the Maui Ocean Center eventually. Great, that's really great. Yeah. I, I would say my observation, especially with this last work with COVID Dreams, is that like artists who work together for, or just work on the same project, type of project for a long time, it, the space begins to empty out. Just like in de Kooning, where it got less and less and less busy. In the music, it gets less and less and less busy. And mm. I, the visuals too, for Mike. This one is really pretty clean. I mean, it's simple and simple straight lines, drawings, you know, and and the music has got a, ve a ventilator going all the way through the whole thing. Oh, <laughs> that's what you, you thought it was Star oh, Fader, right? Oh, you mean uh, like a hospital ventilator? Yeah. That's what oh. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. you can't hear it because the uh, other sound um, drowns it out or Emotionally, it's like we forget about this stuff while the rest of our life is going on, but it's still going on in the background. We're still breathing. You know? mm. Today, hopefully, we're still breathing. Hopefully. Well, that sounds well, heavy. That sounds really, term, really interesting. In term, yeah. In terms of the uh, music, ba the balance of the music and the visuals is something you, you initially nailed but probably over the uh, course of your many collaborations, you developed uh, even finer sensitivities to it. But uh, I always think of that uh, time when uh, the, <clears throat> uh, the Imaloma Planetarium director, Sean Lotch, had a 
International Full Dome Film Festival. And there was something like over three or four days, 50 films. He had leading full, full dome film producers, creators from around the world, Holland, Japan, Australia, United States. And there was a, a bit of a seminar or a question answer. Uh, there was a, a fellow who was one of the first uh, directors of the Hayden Planetarium. And my impression after watching and listening uh, to, to maybe 30 of them was that the, the music was overloading it. Uh, that, and it turns out that oftentimes the way they do this is they go to focus groups. After they've finished a full dome film, they go to focus groups to decide what soundtracks to slap on over, over the, the uh, information already out there with the film. And so they, they get a, the people like Pink Floyd or whatever, and they slap that on. And it becomes really too much. It's, it's overwhelming. Uh, uh, the guy from Hayden Planetarium, he agreed. He agreed. He said that when they f did the, one of their first shows of a um, trip, a, a voyage to the outer space, maybe through the planets, he suggested no sound at all. And he was roundly vetoed, but uh, the, the, to the point that, you know, the visuals are so powerful, it's, it's a, a real challenge to make, to calibrate the, the sound in a way that it doesn't detract. On the other, you know, on the other hand, you, uh, the, the uh, music can be so compelling that um, you want the visuals to match it in a way that's uh, equally powerful. But uh, anyway, is there something there that you um, could comment on in terms of that balance? Do you ever go back and forth saying, well, maybe it's too much signal from the visuals or it's not enough from the music, or et cetera? I think from, from my point of view, as far as our collaboration goes, um, um, basically we've kind of worked in reverse. I mean, uh, Bob would send me the music. Oh, uh, okay. And, and then I would work on the visuals from there. Um, often after many false starts on my, on my side until, you know. I think the balance, um, that balance Robert was speaking of. Yeah. I think yeah. that comes from Mike. Because I, I pretty much hand it to him almost complete. I mean, I'll make some mixing changes and some audio changes. But structurally, and if there's some kind of a, a sonic event, I think once I said, Mike, can you just move that thing over about two seconds? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because you needed to okay. sync up with something. But beyond that, it's just really been symbiotic, honestly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what's interesting too is, off, at least on some of the pieces, you know, when, when Bob would send it to me, we, we really wouldn't talk about the content, you know, un until afterwards. And it just, you know, I'm thinking of the Pasalaglia that, you know, <laughs> That was what it was about and then and then uh, somehow it just matched perfectly i think but you guys realize mike didn't know what that was about and it, and it was yeah. about fire uh, in vietnam yeah. and it's all done with snow <clears throat> the art i mean we're talking serendipity i think yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, you guys are speaking the same language for sure because That's it's right i mean it's a really you know profound history of collaboration for both of you and i like how it how it works that you know bob you create uh, the foundation, the musical structure of it. And then Mike, you're free to interpret it, but you guys trust each other. And I think that's why the relationship is so effective is because you trust each other with, with, you know, gleaning your own insight based on whatever your personal experiences are with it. It's worked out really, really well. Mike, when I get, sorry, but when I give a piece to Mike, it's not like handing my baby in, you know, <laughs> to the editor who will change it all. I trust him. It's like giving it to my brother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Always has been. Mm -hmm. And I think while we're on this too, it's, um, you know, as far as the, the dome presentation goes, and you know, I really got to give so much credit to Peter too for Very you know, taking, taking the music, taking the video and somehow, I don't know how you do it, but, you know, making it. <laughs> None of know, us do. Horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Barely. I, I forget each time I have to learn again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the thing, you know, we're getting rusty about the whole notion of, public performance 
becoming a faded. Uh, yeah, that's a scary thing, actually, because yeah, yeah. I was given an opportunity for some for some work recently, and I mm. wasn't really comfortable doing it because I was like, well, I haven't I haven't really been out there doing this for some yeah. years. I mean, talking about you know photography, which it, it's a high pressure situation. I was like, I don't think I can handle a high pressure situation like that right now. Not totally green. I feel totally green. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a very strange time. There's, this is an unprecedented time for us, and it's going to show up in the arts for a long time, I, I think. Yeah, there was a comment, one of the, the if you ever watched the uh, Kaiser Report, um, comment uh, comparing it to the Renaissance, that after the Dark Ages, um, that culminated the Dark Ages in a pandemic, Black Plague, and coming out of that, we had the Renaissance, that we didn't know it was the Renaissance at the time, but it, that's what started to happen. Maybe and, we'll live long enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so you're, the, it is gonna change, it's gonna change all the arts, even to the point where, what are people gonna wanna hear after all of this? I think even that's gonna change, you know? We, and we don't know yeah. what it is. Yeah. Uh, so I think we need to, well, for me, I'm just not, spending any money on expensive musical equipment that's how we figure this out <laughs> well are yeah. you making stuff bob are you are you would you consider yourself actively creating in this time oh uh, yeah i absolutely am um some music i'm uh, also writing a lot of um prose i have another book on the on the burner and i have all this national geographic stuff going and i find it writing words and write by words i mean uh text not libretto uh, it's pretty much the same process as writing music. It's just a different dialectic. I mean, the mm. st structure and form and, you know, foreshadowing, all the stuff we do in music composition, it's all there. So I'm doing that in the meantime. Yeah. And, and is it informed by the uh, current situation in some way, or is this your chance to explore ideas that you've had in mind for a long time, but now you have the time or the capacity to uh, fulfill those ideas? I have so much time, it's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, uh, mostly ideas that I had before, because as you may know, I've been a, a big fan of the desert for a really long time, and I've just been hired to write a bunch of articles tying in the Northwest up in British Columbia and up that way with out in the Mojave, and that there, there are some really strange, interesting connections. So to me, that's like comparing Kandinsky to Schoenberg. You know, mm. they're, they're connected. That kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Reminds me of Twin Peaks somehow. I don't know if you ever saw that show from the 90s, but it's kind of a surreal, you know, detective fantasy show. <laughs> it takes place both in the desert and in the Northwest, it reminded me. Um, so do you feel like the, the work that you're doing journalistically is um, in any way related to your creative pursuits right now as well? Well, it's all coming out of my brain. <laughs> <laughs> I guess but, you know, I, have a, I have a deep philosophy of life, and I try to. I believe as an artist that I hope, and I hope I do do it correctly. That whatever the media is, uh, medium is, uh, some part of me is going to show up, going to come out of me. I don't see how it can't. We, we've talked about that before, actually, where uh, uh, a creator's style is reflected completely in their work and sometimes it's the choices of what to remove or the selective choices of what to to keep or focus on that we are exposing our true nature through our own style and we can't intentionally fix our style our style just manifests in whatever it is that we're creating as long as we're doing it you know uninhibited just right. freely copying somebody else and then that there's a lot of that going on but i think it has a lot to do with mike also because our personal philosophies of life are somewhat different but but um our, philosoph our artist philosophical concept, I think really the same. And we've sat there and talked about the same artists, visual artists for years and years, huh. and yeah. musicians too. And we'd share, when I was still teaching at Maui, we'd share, uh, if I was teaching a music history class, I'd go and borrow art videos from Mike and, and vice versa. So uh, it, we're really connected in a very unique way. And it's not like being songwriters. I don't think we'd ever get no. <laughs> yeah. When we reach applying our different mediums to, you know, to the same piece, which, you know, really is kind of an intriguing process, too. And, um, you know, I think really brings out the creativity in, in the both of us that way. Well, I like and, and, uh, sometimes, I'll, actually, this has a little bit to do with process. 
when I am putting together something that I know is going to end up in, in one of these collaborations, like this last piece, uh, I think about what Mike will probably do or how Mike's process works kind of in advance. And I'll say, well, that's probably not going to work if I make it sound like that. Mm -hmm. but, you know, and, but it might work if I did this. You know. That's direct collaboration while not sitting in the same room. So we're, we're just doing this quarantine thing. We've been doing it for 12 years. We never worked together personally face to face. Isn't oh, that, is that right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's true. Yeah. Well, except the, all of the pre creative, uh, actual creative work you just said, you, you yeah. dialogued and shared art and music and all the rest. So that, that was sort of the, the, uh, what, what would you say the resource from which you, you were tapping all of this, uh, uh, all of these collaborative works and, um, you know, there, there was a, a point at which the, you may have heard this, uh, the director of the Imaginarium, Joe Ciotti, got a little bit frustrated with us because everything started with the music, for the most part, most of these works. And he was um, generous enough with his time to then apply the in-house effects. So he asked at one point, could we do it in reverse? where some visual uh, thing that I create, Joe creates, uh, could then be submitted to an, a composer. We did that with John Magnuson, uh, who could easily commute and so on. So they went back and forth in that way. But, you know, what's great to me about our Music of the Spheres is precisely that it, norm, it usually starts with a musical piece or musical impulse and then adds the visuals whereas most planetaria show uh, do the other you know they start with the visuals and then slap on a, a soundtrack at the end right so, so there's all laser led zeppelin shows you know yeah exactly you know so uh, although maybe there maybe there there's the appeal of the music group you know that draws the audience. Yeah, but, if you put Led Zeppelin in the title, you're going to get you yeah, know Led yeah. Zeppelin fans going. And then, and that, I guess but, that's the case where the music was written 40, 50 years ago, and then they're slapping mm -hmm. visuals onto it. So that's kind of our our process in a way. You know, uh -huh. That stuff has extra musical content because it's been around for so long, and that Led Zeppelin song means this to me, and it means that to Robert. And you know, Mike was dating his wife. Well, this certain other song came to us, and you know, it's their song. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, would, I wanted to ask you a question, Bob, about what you're, you were saying that when you're composing the work for these dome shows or when, when you're composing work that you know will be in the hands of Mike to create visual images and, and animations for, you are considering that as part of the process. So some of the choices you make uh, are informed by anticipating that Mike is going to be listening and interpreting it. Is that kind of what you were saying? Yeah, that's right. And some of this has been learned by trial and error over the years, of course. But yeah, absolutely. And if you listen to the music or look at the very earliest uh, of our shows, which was Cosmo, it was basically a, it was about panspermia, spreading the seeds of life through the universe. That's yeah. what it was about. Oh, we do we have that one, Peter? We do. Yeah, we yeah. have that one. I want to... Um, we'll, uh, we we should definitely listen and and watch yeah, that. That, that um, was the f that was not the first one though, was it? There was one. I don't know if it was that. the first. It's it's the first one I think that I uh, was a cause, part of preparing okay. for the game. So does this uh, one have a lava lamp in it? Yes, <laughs> that's the second one. I think. Yeah. Right? Okay, that's, that's the second the one. Yeah. yeah. The first. Yeah. When I saw that lava lamp, I mean, when I saw it, Mike came over to my classroom and we sat there and watched it on the big screen. And I, what the heck is that? How did you do that effect? <laughs> it was just a lava lamp. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. And, and yeah, how that, do you tell your division you know, <laughs> And Mike, when you when you get some work from from Dr. Bob, what's your process like listening and interpreting and creating? Yeah, basically, you know, I'd listen to the track a few times over and over again and you know, try to get a feel um, for what's for what's happening. Um, let's, I'll start thinking of some imagery, and you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and so that's you know the process. 
and I'll see how it goes along with the music. And if it's not happening, then I'll, you know, restart it again. Like this latest one that we did, the COVID dreams, I think maybe that's the third take um, on it, you know, until I was finally happy uh, with, with that imagery. So um, great. That's the best one so far, which is always true of the newest one, right? <laughs> well, the next, one will be the, the next one will be the best one. <laughs> yeah. I like, well, yeah. Robert was saying, Mike, Mike's canvas emptied out, you know, and so have all of our hearts and our lives and everything else. It's just a reflection of our time. True. I, I, mm. And me too. I mean, it's less, far less busy, like you said, Robert. Um, I think that empty, busy, less busyness started with the Pasacalia, though. I, I think it did first, because before that mm. came, a beautiful day for bombing, and that was the first half yeah. of that was busy as all get out. Yes, one of our more controversial productions. <laughs> <You're> political. <laughs> 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 yeah. but, I stand uh, by it. <laughs> yeah, uh, so totally do as we. you should. So do, yeah. We. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, do you guys want to watch Cosmos Genome? And yeah. then we can have a few things to talk about. It's a pretty long work, it's about 16 minutes long. Is that uh, okay? Am I looking at the right one here? I think so. Let's see the opening frame of it. Let me just put the opening frame of it on screen, and then you guys can uh, see what we're. So yes. This, uh, yeah. This is your artwork, Mike, right? Yeah. Right. That's where it's left off from the old one, right? Isn't it? Is is, the, is there another one? I mean, uh, maybe there there's a, some. There was a previous one. Um, uh, what was the Cosmos Overture? Cosmos Overture. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. That must have been before my time. I'm not sure. Did, do you know if a copy of that survives? Um, yeah, I, I have it somewhere in my files. Um, I looked at that recently. I wasn't, I mean, the music's great. I wasn't quite happy with the visuals. On that. <laughs> a lot's changed, you know, in 15 years. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't this, this drawing here, Mike, um, the end of the first one also? Because it was about panspermia and the couple. Yeah. And the um, I think the first, the, no. no, that's, the other one earlier, early on. on. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, Beethoven <laughs> probably didn't remember why I put that clarinet part there earlier either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, he probably did, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's take a listen and then uh, let's, see, let's see what happens next. So um, here we are. So this is Cosmos Genome, the second of a series. And I have to make sure that I've got the, uh, the sound going and here we are ready to, to watch and listen. So the, the, what, what year was this about 2011 or am I uh, late to that party? Earlier. Earlier? I think so. Yeah. 2008, 2009. I think when the first planetarium show that I was a part of with Ebon Flow Arts was around 2008. So it may have been around that time, but that's right. That was it. Yeah. From 08 reaching deep into the histories. Here we go. Cosmos genome. Holy.
that's me. <laughs> uh, yeah, that certainly uh, wears well in time, doesn't it? It's just still, uh, still it's, uh, oddly it's relevant. It's aged like wine. I mean, that's yeah, really, yeah, really, really very modern and profound even now. I mean, yeah, actually, some of the effects. Mike, some of the uh, visual material you're working with, um, it actually has become more interesting with age because it's harder to replicate that aesthetic and that style. I think now everybody, uh, a lot of artists go for a very specific look based on the technology that's available. And the technology available now is, you know, through the roof in terms of 4K and clean rendering. But what I like about that work is part of the the noise of the media uh, shows through and, and makes it feel, I don't know, authentic and also relevant to uh, art of that time, you know, 15 years ago, 12 years ago. Um, and it was in standard definition as opposed to high definition, which is something that a lot of video even... artists. <laughs> Did we have it yet, Mike? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have it. <laughs> no, I didn't. Actually, as we mentioned before, the a lot of 99% of that is of a lava lamp and then um and i filmed it on my motorola razor phone i don't know if you remember those <laughs> I <do>. <laughs> wow <laughs> that was the technology wow. i had at the time to do that piece that's but you, you use what you got and the the the, the exponential growth talks about uh, the virus today as well you know yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Which you capture in COVID dreams too a bit. I think so. Yeah, Cause yeah, yeah. Yeah. Before I worked on the COVID dreams piece, I kind of revisited this one again and, you know, wanted to do something similar, but different, of course. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. The COVID yeah. dreams piece, Mike, it's just, it's stark, but it's like brutally stark. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how we would receive it if we didn't know what it was about or that there was a pandemic, you know, or anything, if it was just pure art. I think it would stand up, personally. Yes. Yeah. Right. Sure, the visual part, you know, that, I think you've outdone yourself. Uh, you know, I had never noticed that in the visuals, Mike, that the, this sort of um, small green, greenish turquoise circle mm -hmm. that's that's constant and then there's a second one that appears and then they kind of join yeah sort of an un it's actually a reflection of the the glass on the lava lamp we don't tell don't give away secrets man. oh yeah no, that's okay that's okay <laughs> I you know, uh yeah you know you probably heard me tell the story back when we first started these programs in New Jersey at the State Museum Planetarium in Trenton, or Trenton, as it's properly pronounced. Uh, <laughs> the um, director there was very excited one season because he had acquired a new effect for the dome, a disco ball. <laughs> so it would reflect, you know, the light and so on uh, in an unusual way but um, it, what what strikes me about that is the those the, those reflections which were serendipity but that there's a sort of another tempo going on, another rate of change and also in the music it feels like there are kind of, you know flows of rates of of um, unfolding simultaneously that make it very compelling uh, throughout. I, I would say that comes from the study of Berio, mm. Luciano Berio. I mean, there's stuff like that in the Symphonia. It's just orchestral, you know, and vocal. But where you have more, multiple rivers coming and going at the same up and down, and you can't hear them all, but there they are again, you know. Mm. Same kind of stuff. Yeah. I have yeah. to, I have a confession, which is, I think the panspermia idea was Mike's. Because if you look at this piece, it definitely, that's what it is. I mean, you can see all yeah. the cellular division and everything. Yeah. And I did not have that in mind. I didn't have anything in mind other than to make it be kind of a cool piece. Okay, but we did, you did have the title. 
I believe. Yeah. 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 I mean, what, wasn't that about the time that the genome had finally been mapped out or so, something like that? Yeah. I think it was something. Mm -hmm. like hmm. Maybe I had the title, but you had the idea. <laughs> I think that's that's you know speaks to your collaborative work as well. Yeah. It's exactly what you were saying that, that you're yeah. anticipating that Mike is going to create something, and and you might have had it in mind, and then Mike fulfilled that that dream, and created something that I, I love the the idea of the division of the cells and the creation of life too, and the way that it begins from some very I mean sexual images at first. I mean I don't know if they're really sexual, but you know they're well, they're the, they're feminine, the you know. They're procreative images. Procreative yes. images. And yes. then how ultimately, you know, it takes us through the cycle of, of growth and development and division, and it just kind of keeps growing. And it's almost like we're zooming out from the experience. And then at the end, it becomes just a, a you know, a really tightly knit fabric that's just evolving through colors and shapes. Oh. Uh, so and that la have... last um, infant image, very iconic image that we it is <laughs> used a lot. Especially since we don't know what it is until we pan back, you know, it's just colors. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I always thought so, that the little round circles, those blue circles. Yeah. I thought those were eggs. Mike, I thought those what? Were, I always thought those were eggs that the other oh, okay. division was happening to. It, it works that way. It looks that way to me too. That, that thought yeah. crossed my mind. I, I always thought that. <laughs> so. And Bob, when you're when you're creating the music, what did you? Uh, how did you compose that? In in what medium did you explore sound, and how did you uh, layer and compose and finish that? So that was um, I did that in the early uh, recording studio at, U at Maui Community College, when it was still called that, and um, I was all done in Pro Tools, and I had just been collecting lots and lots of sounds sound samples, kind of like a butterfly collector. And I was just, it was really digital music concrete, mostly. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And all at the same time, the concrete stuff I would either do first and then put something musical in it to hold it all together. Or the other way around, I would put some kind of a pad or something that just would be like a foundation and then drop in these interesting effects. And in this case, it looks like Mike timed them pretty closely. Like yeah, it really kind of grows together, the music and the uh, visuals, for sure. We've not always done that. You know, a lot of times it's called wild tracking, where it's not really in sync at all. You know, it just looks sort of like it. But if you really got down to it and looked at it carefully, it wouldn't really be. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like, it's well, like we're forcing those relationships. We see something and we hear something and we assume that they're connected. Yeah. Also, yeah. crossing open spaces. And that piece, that piece, Mike just got that one. I don't know if it took you like five minutes to do it. You know, it's, oh. it was just so automatic. It was just very, very organic, the whole piece, from both sides. Yeah. Well, one thing we've discovered over the years that almost any music can go to <clears throat> any visual, just because there's so many of these parallels between the medium, uh, and then. After that, it's a matter of really finding appropriate matches and even going further into synchronization. Peter has done some of that uh, quite intricate synchronizing. For example, uh, the piece, uh, Tony Walham's uh, piece with uh, Verez, Poem Electronique, uh, and, and also the Warren and Times Encomium with Martha Woodbury's painting you did a, a lot of very precise synchronizing so it That's can get great. down to that or it, it need not in a way it, it as you've done it it has this or, um, organic uh parallels and and melding and and uh, works also quite well so that's interesting you know the composer don woman he said yes. the same thing about all i think he's been to just about all of the performances over the years and he said, it's really organic. That's his comment. And both parts of it, and it's really merged into a whole, as opposed to just being audio and video yeah. visuals. 
uh, he had always said my own personal writing was organic and that it just kind of transferred on into this. And Mike's work has been as organic as I can think of as long as I've known him. Yeah, you know? yeah. Synergistic, really, in, in, in that sense, greater yeah. than yeah. the two yeah. separate elements. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it's, um, but you know, Robert, if, if you took a piece like, let's say your, uh, uh, the, the James Brown piece of yours, the one you have, what is that called? Um, uh, you know the one. I'm oh, gee, for uh, contrabass and piano. Yeah, that, that uh, would bass and piano. I'm trying to trying to remember the title, but it's yeah, well, it's the same right. as the James Brown song. Anyhow, <laughs> I was wondering if you took a piece that wasn't intended to be like for for a collaboration like what Mike and I've been, I've been doing. Like, just take one of your pieces. Yeah, your music, right? Uh, how it would work if because with Mike, because I think Mike, it's Mike's sensitivity that makes it all fit together. Because I'm there first, and he picks up he picks what he. Up, up, picks it up and makes it a whole, which I think you could do with just about anybody's music, actually. You know. Yes. You know, be interesting. Have you have you worked with anyone else, Mike? Uh, any other composers? No, I haven't. Uh huh. Yeah. Interesting. They're not all as easy to work with. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you work with the best, you know, it's hard to. Practice <laughs> a few thousand miles away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So you have to create the wormhole, you know, the, the consciousness wormhole. You're in Santa Cruz, Mike's in Maui, and then you suck together through the dreams and, you know, <laughs> make something together. Yeah. Connected through strings. Piece, you know. I still have that up my sleeve. We, I still have a percussion piece to do for, with Mike. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. I played part of that for you, I think, a while ago. It's not done. Okay. Yeah. Better start gathering your, your images, Mike. Percussion piece could have a lot of things to time up. <laughs> yeah, this one's really tight, too. It has super, super tight timings among all the instruments. But anyway, that's coming. Look forward to that. Looking forward to that. And so, Mike, during this time of uh, lockdown, I haven't yet heard what on earth have you been up to? I mean, I understand you guys are trying to get back to school and, and teaching, but how's everything going and how's it been for you? Well, it's been um, pretty hectic, shall I say, especially these last few weeks. We are, you know, the semester starting in a couple weeks. Um, like, I believe 75% of the classes at the college are going to be online. But, you mm. know, there's certain classes that are like next to impossible to do uh, distance and among them are my you know studio art classes so I will be meeting you know with my classes of course social distancing you know face to face and you know everyone's got masks on um, plexiglass or um, just just by having our desks um, spread further enough apart um, keep all the windows open you know keep the fans on so you know there's a lot of air circulating and everything and um it's really going to be a challenge to see how this works and so, how do you do the online uh the online classes would be via zoom like this where you have 20 30 people and yourself mm -hmm. you know on online um and trying to do it that way very you know again very challenging for a, a studio mm -hmm. class yeah. to do that i mean um because you're not there physically to, you know, actually, you know, help the students, you know. How are they doing the music classes? Pardon me? How are they doing the music classes? I mean, that's even worse. Yeah, I believe they're almost all online except for Joel. Um, he's teaching piano, um, which is going to be live. It has and to. also, also it's his um, music uh, technology classes will be live. Yeah. I mean, yeah, which yeah. leaves not much, <laughs> not much is left after that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the academic classes we could, we could do, I, you could do them, I could do them, the history classes and all of that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Performance classes, not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose this becomes a component in all our future education classes and teaching people how to teach, you know. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Especially, you know, last semester. And, um, uh, spring semester, I mean, right after spring break, we just went totally online. I mean, we didn't have any choice at all and just, you know, had one week in advance warning 
to prep for that. So, yeah, very, uh, very challenging. Well, that's a a, <laughs> you just have to dive in and see how it goes, I guess. Uh, I mean, I've, I've seen performing arts teachers, it's just almost impossible to try to teach uh, anything musical, theater, or dance uh, with any kind of meaning you know through zoom it's just that the sync the synchronicity of it doesn't work the audio doesn't work and there's glitches that make it i mean my daughter was in a dance class and uh you know bless them all for trying but it was a complete failure (laughs) and there's fear of the camera my piano students at at maui they were terrified if i just walked over and stood next to them and watched what they were doing (laughs) if i came up with a camera right so let's send this out to everybody you know (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> you need to practice a little more. Good incentive for practicing. There it is. Yeah, there it is. That vulnerability leads to more accountability. <laughs> yeah. And, but yeah, Mike, but other than that, Peter, I've been uh, you know working on my own you know uh, art as well, painting, doing some printmaking. Um. So, obviously, once the semester starts, that's going to slow down some. But at least I had the you know opportunity to you know work on my own work as well. Are you still department chair? Uh, yes, I'm a department chair for humanities, which... Which is the squirreliest department in the college, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. unfortunately, my timing right now with, with this uh, COVID situation, everything is so up in the air and things change constantly. Yeah. What's, it, what's enrollment like for the fall? It's down, but at the same time, it's lately it's been going up, um, which is a good thing. But but at the same time, the the whole University of Hawaii system has taken a major major hit financially, as you know, as the state goes too. So there's, you know, no money to hire lecturers. Um, we lost so many positions, you know, that were not filled, and you know the the Senate or the Board of Regents just swept them away. So. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as faculty goes, and not only faculty, but also personnel were shorthanded. Well, that sounds about like what it was when I started working there. <laughs> yeah. Back to yeah. roots, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's tragic to, to hear about uh, such massive changes so swiftly as well. Um, uh, although on the contrary side of it, I know a lot of adults who since they're out of work are now applying for scholarships and trying to go back to school. So I think it's kind of shifted the incentive for those that were otherwise employed to pursue new careers. And I I hope that that does boost up, you know, the importance of, you know, higher academia. Right. Well, UH Maui, I mean, that's, the island needs a a university that's a university and a community college. It needs both. And I think there's going to be a lot of career changes coming up to middle-aged folks probably have to happen, which means they're gonna come back to college. It's one massive midlife crisis unfolding in front of us all. (laughs) (laughs) Especially for a lot of the younger students, you know, who would have gone, you know, to a mainland college, um, you know, suddenly because of this, you know, a lot of them are opting to stay, you know, stay Mm -hmm. home on the islands. What happened to my son? He had a baseball scholarship to USC, baseball, and they're not playing. Mm. So he got it. He moved to Hilo. He's going, he's playing on the UH team there. But it's the same kind of thing. He would have gone to USC, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With a scholarship, yeah. 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 Huh. Yeah. It's a serious, very serious. But, um, well, um, why don't we have another example of uh, the collaboration so i just found like- something great is uh i i i had not forgotten about crossing open spaces i just had it cleverly hidden in some folder and i only now just found it um so that would have been from just last year i think is that right mm-hmm. and the unique property of this work is that i have two separate files i have an audio and a video file so um If you guys are interested in in hearing and watching that, it'll just take me a second to try to pair those together. I've got to figure out a way to do that. Um, Do you want to talk a bit more about the collaboration while I'm getting that work prepared? Sure. Sure. Okay. So, So do you know where that came from? Crossing Open Spaces? Did I ever tell you what it was about? (laughs) (laughs) 
I think I'd mentioned something about, uh, I don't know. I think your idea was more kind of an ocean scene maybe, or ocean. Yeah, kind of. Originally the idea was, I had done my hike across the Mojave Desert, which is crossing open spaces. And it was mm. really more about that. But you know, the desert and the sea are almost the same thing in, in a lot of ways. Mm. You know, so it was like that, yeah. Crossing okay. a big open space. Yeah. You got the big, the big sky part. Yeah, so that's what I saw it as, is crossing open spaces as our, as our planet, you know, goes around the sun. You know, yeah. That, crossing Plus, that space. Apropos the planetarium setting, yeah. 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 And Robert's been more specific in the last few pieces, too, about how, how long they should be. You know, can you make it about eight minutes? I mean, you've said that a, a few times, Robert. Or that's about what you'd like. You know, so that works too. It's good to have a few constraints, mm -hmm. I, 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 which I think maybe is why 12 tone music became so popular because you had a lot of rules. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. What, years ago um, in New Jersey, the, um, there was a music critic, Michael Redman, who, who used to say that that was the optimal duration for a modern music piece, eight minutes. Hmm. Uh, for reasons of ability to concentrate beyond that and and um, uh, don't know quite how he came up with it but um, and we don't want to be too restrictive obviously well, so there, we there was it minutes last time and I made it seven <laughs> seven oh okay <laughs> And then there was an and even even earlier there were, we had a one of our first series of concerts in New Jersey in a Atlantic Community College and uh, we were welcomed uh, generously at first but then the the administrator in charge resigned from her position and it was taken over by someone not at all sympathetic to the music we were doing so shortly thereafter we got a letter from him saying that there will be no more than 15 minutes of 12 tone music on each concert. <laughs> so, yeah. yes. But sometimes uh, the music calls for its own duration, you know. <laughs> yeah. It should you go through. It shouldn't be restricted. Go through, you know, no you play. codas. No more codas, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, a 17 minute piece and 15 minute comes up, everybody stops playing and that's it, <laughs> walk off the stage. Yeah. But um so yeah, we don't want to be too, but um, do you have it all queued up now, Peter? Or is it, I, I do, it? I do. So oh, it's such okay. a, a massive high quality file. I hope I can get it to play back without stuttering. Um, however, if there are stutters in our live playback here, what I can do is I'll edit it in later so that it's a seamless playback. So we'll just have to do our best to kind of get through the uh, nine and a half minutes or so. And um, it should be okay. But But the file you gave me, Mike, is is like pristine raw quality. So I hope that my computer is up to the task to play it back live. So um, let me just get the screen up there and make sure I'm sharing the sound. And, and here we go, Crossing Open Space is a collaboration premiered in 2019 at the, was it at the Poliku Arts Festival, Robert, at the Imaginarium in Kaneohe or was it just a yes. separate show? Yes, yes. And so the Polyco Arts Festival, that was um, maybe our third or fourth annual um, right. trip over there for that. So the Polyco Arts Festival is an afternoon, a family-oriented afternoon where... <laughs> although although now, now my memory uh, is a little vague now. We had a, a standalone show because the Polyco Arts Festival had been canceled that one year. We had it in May. Was this done there or was it the... Remember that... Um, uh, event we had a lot of the composers there visual artist carlin ma was there i think that was one before this one okay okay yeah i think it was 2017 so all right so here we go crossing open spaces <laughs>
Yeah. So, so the title crossing open spaces uh, for me is, is really evocative and almost agoraphobic, but I don't think it's meant to be that way. Tell me about the title, Bob. Um, yeah, I can understand that. It wasn't about that. Honestly, it was inspired by walking across the Mojave Desert, which is, I, I have never felt agoraphobic out there like that. But it, uh, I guess I, I can see how someone who had tendencies like that might <clears throat> interpret it that way. <laughs> to me, it feels like, uh, and, and I'm not agoraphobic, but, but I feel very, very small in a very vast universe. Right, right. I think that that feeling came from me when I saw the movie Interstellar. I don't know if any of you saw that. Yeah. It was, re, I mean, it basically pounded home the theory of relativity, essentially. You know, like if you're going the speed of light and your kids aren't, they're going to age faster than you, right? <laughs> that, that sort of thing. So I think it was by crossing the vast open spaces originally in space, which Mike kind of picked up by having the moon there. Uh, but once again, it was just one of those things that Mike and I just have been lucky <laughs> be good at mm. sussing out each other's uh, intu yeah. intuition. I guess. That's great. Yeah, yeah it's, um, you know, there's um, the old cliche about uh, a, a visual in a movie, or let's say that, you know, without the music, that visual would have been boring or uninteresting. <laughs> But the, it works the other way, you know. Some music without the visuals would be also boring. Sure. So that what you achieve, in my opinion, is this codependence where each fulfills the other, each side of the, the equation uh, fulfills the other's need to gain a, a, a interest but in an equal way and that that's a very hard or limited area in in which to explore that or in which to succeed let's say because it's so easy that for the balance to go one way or the other and and go to imbalance but don't you feel that peter that mike and, and bob have have achieved this kind of perfect uh um, you know, equality of, of medium so that they, they, they just balance. One doesn't need more than the other. Yeah, here are my thoughts is that um, it's a very, I mean, codependence kind of implies maybe, a, you know, in, in terms of a relationship, not necessarily uh, a healthy relationship, but a codependence in terms of an interwoven synergy, I think is, is also what you mean. And I think it's really beautifully embodied in this work, especially because uh, yeah. Mike's images and the photographs convey such a sense of openness and it's the music works really really well in that way too because you can almost lay on your back and have sort of a transcendental moment where you're almost you know outside of your body and when you're looking at the sky and the sunsets and the clouds you know I'd, I'd start to get reflective both outwardly and inwardly okay. and you like, if you lay there on your back and just stare up at the sky uh, like you could just float on up there, kind of. That's exactly what I mean. That's exactly the feeling I get. And to yeah. know that you had the Mojave Desert in mind, yeah. to me, evokes, again, that sense of scale where, where we're very, very small. I mean, we're, we're atoms in, in a, you know, an incomprehensibly mm. large universe, you know. Sure, sure. I was just looking at the pictures of Voyager sent back of taking pictures of the Earth from way out there and how insignificant that yeah. is to, as big as the planet is to us, you know, it's yeah. tiny. The pale blue dot. Yeah. The thing I had with the, the visuals too is that I, I believe um, when we first talked about this, we had the intention of it playing in the um, planetarium, I think right off. So, so that's why I really went with that sky, the, yeah. you know, yeah. the cloud, the sky. Oh uh, yeah. You know, I was visualizing it up in, sure. you know, up in the dome. Well, now that we know, yeah. you know, like when Robert, you'll call us up or email and say, can you, you guys have another piece for us? You're right. And uh, now that we've been doing this for a while, um, I, I think I'm getting this dome mentality. <laughs> 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 what works and what doesn't. And Mike seems to have the same thing, you know. 
Because sometimes the, the art got changed around a lot to fit in the domes, you know, over the years sometimes, you know, a little bit here, a little paneling, the tiling there, right, and all that. I think we all have a better idea of what we're doing now. Yeah, because yeah, when you guys would submit work to me, um, in order to make it fit into this massive you know, super high quality 4K environment, I would typically kind of take a little bit of liberty to try to scale it up to fit in the environment. So sometimes um, it, would, it might result in a little bit of increased noise as I increase the size of the video, or I would end up mirroring and tiling it and then kind of creating a, uh, like a vignette where the audience would be focused on. So it gets, you know, darkened around the edges from there. And um, it was a lot of fun to see how I could take your work and expand it and try to make it fill the environment too. Because, you know, there's not many people who have the capacity to create these full dome 4K works, you know, because it's kind of an extra, a pretty big extra step there. Um, right. And it's a team effort, you know, it's, you're the team and we just have yeah. these things too, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But as we get further yeah. along with these dome presentations, you know, my aesthetic has changed a bit too, where now I focus a lot more on capturing video that I can just leave pretty raw and just project video up there. And the last work I did for the dome, uh, I think at the same show as we premiered Crossing Open Spaces, um, was Nalu. And all I did with, with Nalu is I just oh. had a drone hovering over the shoreline and I would just capture the waves breaking for, you know, 10, 15 minutes at a time and then edit that together because I just wanted it to feel like, 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 it, so in your work, you're laying on your back, gazing at, at the sky, pondering what's outside mine. It was meant to be, you're gazing downward at the earth. So they kind of work together in that, mm -hmm. in that way. Um, uh is there any work of, since we're talking in general about our programs called Music of the Spheres that we've done maybe 15 times, something like that, uh, in two planetarium in Hawaii, in Hawaii, the Imaloa and the Imaginarium. Uh, Peter, your work has always been part of it. Uh, before we play another one of Bob and Mike's collaborations. Is there any work you'd like to project at this point? So there's there's one work that um, okay. I had collaborated with uh, the Hilo-based artist Tomas Belsky on um, some years ago. I think that was about five years ago. Yeah. And he'd submitted some line drawings to me and some prints, um, which I scanned in and, and created and put them into a 3D environment and then created lighting and shading and animation. And then I combined that with um, some video I shot in Iao on Maui in Iao Valley in w the West Maui area. And um, the music that I created for that was, I recorded a lot of guitar tones and I was trying to imitate, I was trying to sort of modernize the slack key uh, method of performance where you, you know, tune your guitar to an open tuning and you can play and strum and, and, and work in that environment, um, that musical environment. So I recorded a bunch of tones and I recreated some different sort of, you know, Hawaiian, songs and created a work based on that so the, the work is called moe uhane which roughly translates to dream but really means like soul sleep the sleep of the soul and um i wanted to create kind of an abstract thing uh with that and it was never i had never actually found the the video source file in the last couple of years having gone through a few different hard drives so i just put that up on youtube yesterday and um, that's something we could check out, Robert. That's kind of the okay. freshest thing I got going on. <laughs> That'd be great. That'd yeah, be great, well, Peter. Thanks for letting me share. Let's. Um, I'll try to link in uh, the work of Tomas as well, um, so that maybe he could be a future guest on on one of our podcasts too. That could okay. get pretty wild. <laughs> I know you all know each other. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's take a let's take a listen and look to this. Hopefully, hopefully it's as good as I uh, remembered it being. <laughs> Here we go.
I remember seeing that was yes. it in Hilo. It was uh, having those drawings just right yeah. across the dome. That was just amazing. Yeah, you certainly had the full dome in mind. Just a sec, guys. Yeah. So right, Matisse somebody test the audio. Kind of stuff. <laughs> Matisse, look, yeah. yeah. Matisse. Single line drawings, amazing. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of the you... Nazca Plain down in Chile. You know, where they have those huge drawings down there. Oh, oh yeah. Miles long, but they're drawn like that when yeah. they're ancient. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. So Tomas had, um, you know, from what I understand, they're single line drawings. Yeah. And so I wanted to explore the idea of, you know, two dimensional plane uh, with that work. And that was one of those works where I think the the music, Robert, like you say, it, it might not stand as well on its own. And I conceived of all of that together. So I actually composed the music in a video environment, you know, by layering all the sounds and stuff and then working with the video. So that was one of those things that was kind of a, an all in one creation. Yeah, well, it's, it's an aspect of it of the of the mixing in with the slack key and the some mm -hmm. traditional sounds of the guitar in there, and destroying yeah. them at the same time. Yeah, tear, tearing it apart. I I like to do that a lot. Well, that was the same kind of thing where with visually, you know, we're looking deeper into the the layers and the the plane of that two dimensional shape. And then so it was the same thing with the music as I started to to pull it apart and try to look within the harmonic layers of it too. So. I like to do that with music just to really, I mean, I don't, you could, you could take anything and slow it down 8,000 times and see all this crazy intricate harmonics that come out of it. Even like a Justin Bieber song, for example, becomes a, <laughs> a completely other thing, you know, at that point. Yeah. Uh, we've done things like take a, take a song, any song and slow it re way down. It's better if there's no singing but slow it way down until it's really not recognizable anymore. And then just pick pieces out of it, segments of sound, which I'm sure that's a Stockhausen thing probably going all the way back. Wouldn't you say, Robert? Probably so, yeah. That, that's real music concrete tape manipulations, only we just use computers now. Yeah, yeah with computers, you can resample it so that it doesn't, so when you slow down with a tape, you know, the pitch changes drastically lower. Um, but when you resample with a computer, and you know, that was technology that started, in the 70s and 80s with computers, you can resample it so it doesn't change the pitch. And then really, you know, you're limited by the amount of samples per second, which typically in digital technology is like 44,000 or so. Um, it could be a lot more studio digital quality could be 128,000 samples mm -hmm. per second. So that's what you're limited to is, is how many samples you can get and how you stretch out those little windows of time. I think I might be wrong, Bob, but is that kind of like what granular synthesis is? Maybe you know about that? Granular synthesis, in, in part, in part. But that, that really implies some other things too. Uh, different combinations of synthesis. There's so many different types these days, right? But gran granular, you know what dithering is? Yes, of course you do. Yeah, <laughs> do it all the time. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> digital dithering, it's the spaces in between the digital packets of information. There's, I don't know if it's time or physical or both. I don't know, but it's some, it's great. It gets granularized, as it were, which is where there uh, if you have one bit here and a bit there, and it's trying to guess which is what the middle one sounds like because it's not there anymore. And it's, it's kind of interesting, yeah. So, so yeah. it interpolates between two samples to create a continuous shape. So does your CD player, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the CD player does it with uh, filtering, though, right? So it's it's a uh, anti-aliasing. Right, because otherwise it would fold over or something, the frequency band. Well, the aliasing thing is weird too, because that's also a, a visual thing as well, too. It's like the stagecoach wagon wheels turning backwards. Mm. You know, you see right. those, that's aliasing. And it's a good example it's because they're out of sync with the film speed, which would have been what, 24 frames per second back in the day, something like that. And if the wheel was, had 12 spokes and it turned all the way around once, in a second, it would look like it was only going around once because of the, as opposed to going around a bunch of times. What I'm trying to say is that the film speed or their digital recording speed and the speed of what's going, being presented have to match up, otherwise it won't look right. You know, the wheels will go backwards. Have you ever seen um, uh, like an iPhone recording or a, a mobile device recording of a, like a helicopter uh, rotating? 
oh, right, yeah. the airplane propellers too. Yeah. Yeah, and because it's it's actually sampling the image from top to bottom, it can create this these weird bend shapes in addition to the aliasing and shuddering that you're talking about too. So you can get some rolling down the propellers, right? Yeah, yeah, all, or even a guitar string. It'll make it look like it's going like this sometimes. All aliasing, and you can hear it. They discovered it in in music in the invent with the invention of digital samplers, the audio aliasing. And there's this thing called a Nyquist frequency. I don't know if this is again too technical, which is uh, you need to sample something at twice the rate of the sampling rate. It needs to be twice as fast as the frequency of what you're sampling. So if you're sampling a, a 15,000 cycle sound, you need to sample it at 30,000 cycles. And if you don't, you're going to get that same sound an octave lower or two octaves lower there anyhow created by the sample rate recording itself. It's a really strange thing, but you can hear it. You can hear what you just played two octaves lower softly, softly in the background. And it's so kind it's, of based on the, the, the range limits of um, human pitch perception too. Like we can hear too, I mean, if we're young and we have perfect hearing, you know, about 20,000 cycles per second. So that was sort of the idea with the Nyquist frequency is they would shoot for just above that so that all possible pitches that we could hear would be able to be represented. Right, so hence the 44.1 or and all of that, that cycling, sampling good. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, Technology. Nothing would sound good. But records always sound better though, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The analog, <laughs> yeah. <from> my vinyls. <laughs> I hear cassette tapes are coming back. I don't know if that's true, but I, oh, I've, seen, I've seen them for sale again. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the pretenders to the throne, you know. These are going to replace records. Well, they didn't, did they? CDs did, but the cassette didn't. We just thought it would, but it didn't offer all the cool things like random access. The records have random access, right? You can drop the needle anywhere you want. And you can play it in any order, whereas the cassette, you know, and it didn't sound good either. Yeah, well, at least it was analog, I, I guess. I think that's what they're going for. <laughs> you know, whatever, it's, it's hip, you know, the, it's the, the new hipster analog movement. Yeah. Right. Although the problem with records to come back. Yeah. Well, <laughs> don't hold your breath, but it could happen. <laughs> I did see some for sale at the thrift shop the other day. And I don't even think you can buy an eight track player. I mean, they got to be rare. <laughs> you used to have one in your car, Mike? We used to. Yeah. You did. I thought you really, I'm, I'm actually not kidding. You did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just click the button, press the button and click it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Oh, Yeah. Um, well, we have more of the collaborations, Peter. And, uh, you know, it's uh, looking at the sky and, and the drawings and all. It's, it just tells us how valuable the arts are now in these times. Reading literature, just reading through... Um, the Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner. That's uh, amazing that you mentioned that, Robert. I'm sorry, but I'm actually reading that right now, too. You're, yeah. Uh, is it because Mary Trump? There's no Mary reason. Trump. I just saw it on the oh. shelf, and I wondered if I'd read it before, and I, I grabbed it, and I just opened it last week. So I uh, read the Mary Trump book, though. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And, you know, she studied Faulkner in college, in, in graduate school, she, and she has a degree in uh, Faulkner. And, and she, the reason was she was so drawn to the Compson family in, in uh, Faulkner because she felt it was like her family, her Trump family. Right. There are a lot of parallels there. But, um, you know, with Faulkner, for instance, his, sometimes his descriptions of just um, nature or it, it's co so completely saturated with color and sound and smell. And it, you know, we, it gives us this jumping off point to appreciate what's around us, what's in us, uh, and um, in a way that, that nothing else really can, and, but an art, an art or, or a visual musical experience like we, we've just been witnessing, um, it really enables us to appreciate our world around us um, and perhaps part of the 12 step program for shopaholism is 
doing that, you know, just realizing what value there is on, in things not necessarily material. Um, the Church of Shop of Stop Shopping. Do you know that organization? No. Um, Don't they suffer from Galleria? Galleria. Suffer from Galleria? Yeah, they suffer suffer from disorders. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's it's run by a fake reverend, Reverend Billy. His name is, and they would they started by going into Starbucks and uh, exorcising the cash register, and then promptly getting arrested and all the rest. And there was another rally in which they paraded around with big balloon, uh, you know, dummies of Mickey Mouse, calling Mickey Mouse the Antichrist and that sort of thing. But <laughs> Uh, but basically, you know, this this consumerism that so uh, developed us, we we now have to think uh, differently about shopping, mm -hmm. and which is probably a good thing uh, in, several, in some way. Several yeah. reasons, you know, are yeah. obviously the economy de depended upon it. Yeah, you know, and can you remember there have been movements like "Don't shop at mobile this week, next Tuesday." Nobody buy gas from them. Uh -huh. Never seemed to work. But if you really did boycott everything, the nation would collapse economically. Right. And, if we all stop paying our bills at the same time. Or <laughs> <laughs> just going to work. But <laughs> yeah. it's kind of interesting on the um, recent uh, primary election, it was the uh, American Shopping Party. Oh, really? And it, yeah. In uh, here in Hawaii? Here in Yeah, it was or on my Maui ballot. I forget if they were running for Congress or I think they were running for Congress. Um, was was that the part of the ballot where you declare your party affiliation? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh, and if you picked okay. the American Shopping Party, you had one person to pick. One from. candidate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there are four shopping. Is that the idea? I, I guess. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, they must be really frustrated right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're having a tough time. But, they just yeah. want to get back to normal. <laughs> But as you guys were actually having an uptick in COVID, not I mean, if you don't have to talk about that, but it seemed like you are you? Yes, it's yeah. horrible. Yeah. Not in not on Maui, thankfully, but on Oahu, it's um, it's now pretty well out of control. Hopefully, they can do some make some steps, but the problem has been that the directors of health there are incompetent. And oh. if you take one look and listen to the director, um, his name is Dr. Bruce Anderson. Just listen to one sentence, you'll know this man is not up to the to the job. Are you saying, and, Robert, that he belongs in Washington? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, he, the views and commentaries well expressed in this podcast <laughs> do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Ebb and Flow Arts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, but, you know, he, 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 Tulsi, our, our representative, Tulsi Gabbard, called for their uh, firing. She really called him out. Ago. Uh, yeah, but months last ago. night she went, she, yeah. she spoke publicly again about it. I saw that it was, right. but, it was pretty but, shocking. But, the, but, but this, she said this months ago, and she said that if the governor did not force them out, he should resign. So, uh, and what's happened is in a way predictable, but uh, they, it's it's you know has to do with no, no contact tracing. Uh, the testing is not necessarily the fault of Hawaii. It's just that there's not a national program to deliver right. all the supplies needed. But for one reason or another, uh, too lax about op reopening and whatever. You have now 200, 300 cases a day in Oahu. Yeah. The highest rate of increase of infection in the United States. I'd read that too, the, the fastest or the, the highest proportion yeah. of transmission, like it was one, it was like one to one to 1. 1.4 so that every one person who has it would transmit it to yeah. 1.4 other people. I mean, statistically, it averages yeah. out to be that. And that was right. the greatest in the United States, uh, like last week. They still have the, the um, quarantine, inner island quarantine? Again, they do now. Again, if you're... Uh, if you're landing on any other island except Oahu, Oahu doesn't have a 
quarantine from the other islands. But so if it you were coming from way. Oahu to Hilo, you'd be stuck for 14 days? You would, yeah. Yes. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't be able to commute to Maui these days. <laughs> no, it's like impossible for everybody, you know, and that's why the... Uh, the, it's, you know, the rates down in in South Car uh, South, Southern California are pretty rough too. But you're in northern. You're in northern. Yeah, yeah. About a hundred miles south of San Francisco. Right. It's so you're outside of you're in Santa Cruz. Yeah, right on the Monterey Bay. Oh man, no, I have a friend a who worked at the uh, the Buddhist center called uh, Land of Medicine Buddha up in the forest mountains, not far from I think and, SoCal yeah. outside of Santa Cruz. Yeah. And uh, so we did a retreat up there one time, and um, it was absolutely magical. I love it up there. So those mountains are full of ancient redwoods, mm. you know, really old ones, old growth redwoods. And I, I live, where I live, I have a cabin. I got really lucky. It looks like a writer's cabin or a composer's cabin or something. It's just a little three bedroom, I mean, three room cabin, but across the street, the mountains actually start, the real mountains, the Santa Cruz mountains with the trees, like where you were, Peter. Uh, so there are deer and coyotes and all kinds of wildness around, right around here. Huh. Really got lucky. That's nice. beautiful. How long have you been there for, Bob? I got here on Christmas Day, last Christmas. Oh, so, so just uh, some so eight, eight months. months ago, however long. <laughs> yeah, but just, I came over here originally just to go shoot that National Geographic stuff, and then COVID hit, and and mm. they're still not in production at all. And they're even saying, I mean, I already was paid for the work, so I guess I can't complain too much, but they're even saying, we don't even know what our audience is going to want to see once this is all over, you know, and which is, I think in, in Evan Flo's case, where you guys are presenting is, it's novel, but it's kind of tried and true in a way, in its own niche. It's not like, you has to, it doesn't have to be popular, right? It, not yet. It, yet. it shouldn't <laughs> be popular yet, right? Well, we just put, you know, modern music, you'd say the uh, at least over 100 years of, of it, more than 100 years of it, it, as part of the musical landscape, as it should be, um, even though neglected, but it, it, at least we've probably created the sense that it's um, it's an, an essential part, as the avant-garde is an essential part of any art form. Mm -hmm. Sure. All right. So you don't get Faulkner without having had avant-garde writers before that. I don't yeah. think you do, because of the way he looked at his society was different than the way other writers viewed. Yeah. But it. it um, well, the other thing is that that Mary Trump has been asked. Uh, uh, did uh, her uncle Donald uh, use the N word or was there anti Semitism in the household? And she said, Oh, of course, you know, yeah, sure, you know, like it was, she said it was part of the background. Right. And then you get that from the Faulkner novel too, you know, you, the, the, uh, even you know the overuse of of the N word and and passages that are, you know, anti Semitic on the part of the characters, not Faulkner necessarily, but um, no, because they're authentic to that. I mean, it's, yeah, it's so yeah. stylistic too. It's yeah. so stylistic. Yeah, his his capture of the 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 dialect of the African Americans in the novel is is amazing how well that's what makes it authentic it. yeah and, yeah you know if you cleaned it all up like someone wanted me to clean up my book yeah. the unnatural act which is the dark comedy from vietnam and I, uh, I said if i clean it up it won't be authentic yeah the guys in the armies cuss like sailors <laughs> sure <laughs> yeah. of course deal <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah but uh, um there was another moment that uh, talking about serendipity and uh, with, with your work, Bob and, and Mike, uh, just happening to, to realize the meaning of the music through the visuals and, and in a way vice versa. But um, in the, um, one of my, my project for the, um, our, in the time of Corona is to set, to create little musical 
vignettes with uh, paintings that my daughter is making, mm -hmm. Esther. Uh, she's been painting furiously now through this. Uh, and there, there are um, flower paintings. And uh, one of them is honeysuckle. And so uh, I kind of created the little short piece to the painting of honeysuckle and then realized hmm. I need to smell that flower. Yeah. Maybe a G would become an F sharp or something by, <laughs> by the smell of it. And so still haven't, but so that, so we were set that aside and, you know, went on, and then started to read this book not long ago after that. And one chap, one section of the book, Maybe you've gotten there, Peter, already. It refers to the honeysuckle hundreds of times. You know, Faulkner was like he, it seems like he would just uh, repeat an image over and over or a, set, or a phrase or a saying, you know, like, like music, like you were saying, Bob, you know, it's a musical approach. And he also had what, what Pound called melopia, that is the you know a soundtrack going usually through the whole uh, uh, book, but but he uh, so honeysuckle came come. It's such a symbolic thing in the book, and finally he says that it's honeysuckle is the saddest odor or aroma of all. Sad. Yeah. Interesting. Sad. Wow. Sad aroma. Wow. Why? Why? Did he say? Uh, no, I mean, it, it's in the context of, of course, sort of tragic circumstances sure. in but the it book. It is of kind of a longing scent. Is it? You I know, think it's like, you're like you're saying, maybe you need to go smell it. Yes, and Maybe definitely. you're longing to smell it. Yes. <laughs> but it, it's funny how things happen that way. Yeah, yeah. that's very synchronistic. And uh, yeah. the yeah. longing that you're talking about, Bob, it reminds, we've talked about this on the show before but it's something that I think we often think about during this time is that profound nostalgia, either for the way things were or the way we imagine things used to be, which may not have been perfect, but certainly very different than they are right now. Moving back to the make America great again. <laughs> make America great again, again, let's make America great. Uh -huh, yeah. when, when was that? You know, <laughs> Oh my, we are really in weird times right yeah. now. It's, yeah. At least it's, we have a front row seat to watch history going by. Yeah, that's true. And you know, I'm excited for the for the idea of a of a renaissance. I mean, of course, mm -hmm. you know, the 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 renaissance they didn't they weren't even quite aware that it was the renaissance, but no. suddenly I'm feeling a real surge in creativity whether we have time or the time to reflect on on our situation, but it's yeah. it's it has a profound impact on everybody. And for a lot of people that's not a positive impact. And I think that sometimes that's what it takes to create, you know, art that is both mm -hmm. reflective and meaningful is very challenging circumstances. Well, also Peter and, and Robert and Mike, yeah. if, as we speed forward in, in, into the future, technology is just gonna get faster and faster and more and more powerful. And by 2041, is it? The great singularity? I mean, that if we're being creative in a Renaissance way, there's gonna be so much to work with. It's gonna be mind boggling. We may not even be able to deal with it ourselves. It may just go, you know, I, I think the future is really incredibly bright. We just need to get to the present. Yeah. <laughs> it's like when. <laughs> Luck with that, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when Elon Musk says that if there is true artificial intelligence, we wouldn't even be able to recognize it. It would be so far beyond what we're able to see and experience. It wouldn't like us. No, it wouldn't even have time for us. No. Well, that's one of the theories of Kurzweil is that it will get rid of us eventually. I think I saw that in the Terminator movies too. Yeah. <laughs> in the movie Her. Which movie? Her, where he was dating an operating oh, system. Oh, yeah, with Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> dating an operating system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was pretty well, effective. Well, that's Facebook's goal, as one author said, to become the operating system of our lives. And I here, have, uh, just recently opted out of Facebook. Good for you. 
I yeah. second that opinion. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to keep it going for a while because of my my books. It's really good for selling books. You yeah. know, there needs to be a Facebook site for such and such a book and all of that. But beyond that, all the personal stuff is gone. Or yeah. really, really out of date. And so I just I was just not getting good feelings from all the people that I thought I knew and what they were saying, you know. Mm. Really bad. Yeah, I logged into it recently and just kind of scrolled down because I have to use it for work and, and business too a bit. And uh, none, it was just incomprehensible. It was, it was all these interesting opinions and images from people who I'm loosely connected with, but none of it made sense altogether to me anymore. I, I didn't feel connected to any of it. And you're saying half conversations and other, other things like that too. And uh, it's, well... And the comments on anything are just poison for anything it's, news related. It, it, it's actually really clear why the president is who he is because we look really dumb on Facebook. You know? yeah. <laughs> Except Mike, of course. Oh, <laughs> oh, I'm sure you look great, Mike. I'm sure that we all look fine. <laughs> Brilliant man, though, Mike. You know. You know, the worst of us just grovel in his grace. Well, yeah. a lot of it, you know, social media, it, it was designed to, you know, obviously make money, but it, it became so widely used that we all had to find a way to, to take a piece of it. Because like you're saying, Bob, that's, you know, using it to advertise your work um, for your books and, and your literature and journalism, there's, there's not many other places to do it that are so widespread. It not has to be you. something you do. Yeah, right. I mean, you could certainly get an ad in Time Magazine, but they would go all the royalties for the next five books you wrote, right? <laughs> Yeah. And even from what I understand, you know, advertising, it's got to be down right now. It's got to be much lower numbers. I know for our local papers, one of them, um, I think Robert Maui Time Weekly, they haven't printed in months now. Oh, that's but right. I would tell you my book sales are up now. They're actually up since March. And Good. this last book, it came out in 2016 and it's doing fine. It's kind of puttering along very stably, not, not giant sales, but just a few hundred every month. But but now it's been like 40 months or so and uh, 48 months, I think, and uh, showing no signs of slacking. And now because of the COVID thing, I guess people have more time to stay home and read or, or what yeah. they're buying it. They're buying the hard copies and, and not as much the eBooks, which they used to just buy those. Yeah, it's interesting. Are you talking about Walking Man, The Secret Life of Colin Fletcher? Is that the I, book? Yeah, Walking Man, The Secret Life of Colin Fletcher. Yeah. I'm looking at that right now. I'm gonna have to put that into my wish list. And then I also found um, the unnatural act, rock rhythm and blues in the nom. Yep, that's another one. I have another one coming out soon. It's called the Devil's Playground, and it ties in with the desert in Death Valley. And the main thing is that Death Valley was named in the 1850s or thereabouts because people were dying and, and so on, right? But today, more people die there every year than died in the old days, mm. and it's all because of new stuff, like. Four-wheel drives that take us places we have no business going. Oh, and wow. Getting lost because our GPS told us to turn left. <laughs> and it doesn't go where we need to go. We run out of water. Anyhow, there's hundreds of deaths in the Mojave every year. It's just astonishing. So mostly from people overestimating their skills, you know, their ability and all of that. Yeah, mm. and being misled by the fact that they – our, you know, we're always in pursuit of that unique experience, I think, and it gets harder and harder as the world is more populous and, and I mean, social media, again, we're competitive for that and unique it's a national image. Park and people think, oh, it must be safe, right? But it's mm -hmm. not. So that book is coming, but Walking Man's doing really well. I'm lucky. The publisher says, I won't get rich from it, but I'll have a nice, steady course of bread and butter coming to me for a while. You know, just basic stuff. But that's great. You know, it's good that it even sells at all. It's got great reviews, and congratulations on that success. Oh, thanks. thanks. Yeah, it did. Except for one. <laughs> Except for one. <laughs> uh, there's a, there's a, you know the difference between a typo and a misprint? A, a um, typo is like the, the, there's a wrong letter there, or it says the twice, or, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Mm. But a misprint is the wrong word is there. And I had been, in, there's a chapter where I'm talking about the books that Fletcher had been reading. And he had been reading uh, uh, Samuel Coleridge Taylor, and he'd been reading Henry Thoreau, and he'd been reading some of the great literature. And somehow, 
the, the names of the authors got shrunken into Henry Taylor. Henry Taylor. <laughs> There's no such person. And if some literature buff got on my case, rightfully so, you know, but still. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it's still yeah. doing okay. Well, good. Let's set the record straight what you intended and that it was a misprint. Now it's out in public for everybody to know. <laughs> and Samuel Coleridge Taylor, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. As if that wasn't obvious. And, you know, all you're doing was yeah. trying to save somebody a few microseconds. Well, I'm sure it wasn't intentional. <laughs> the publisher did it. And I missed it in reading the galleys, you know. Yeah. One of the, one of the best um, typos was years ago, a uh, writer for the Atlantic City Press uh, was notorious for making typos and so on. One of the the comments about a concert included a reference to one of the pieces by Hugo Wolf, uh, but it came out H U G E Wolf instead of H U G. <laughs> it was a huge wolf. <laughs> it was. Yeah, and those things they just slip right by. And today with spell check, yeah. never catch it. Mm. No, no. You know, it really takes different. several sets of eyes to be a copy editor. It's, it's hard work. Sure, because nice. the brain, yeah, we trick ourselves all the time when we're reading. I mean, there's so many little trickery games that you can play or that can be played on you, and, and you would never see the mistypes or the errors right. because so of the way that it's line, laid out. Line one ends with the same word that line two starts with. And, exactly and what I'm thinking of. Like, my editor, God bless him. He finds all kinds of stuff like that. <laughs> I couldn't do that. I think I'd have, I, I'd just be stressed out beyond belief being a copy editor or something like that. Tedious work. There's one passage in, toward the end of the, the Faulkner where the, the editor must have wondered, but uh, it, he, he, it's no punctuation whatsoever, but it, it also goes like, uh, use of pronouns, he'll use, instead of she went to the store, he'll say, you, she went to the store. Mm -hmm. And then uh, me, him, uh, me, her did, the, uh, and then there's one, I, I, two I's, lowercase I's in a row, I, I did, and so on. almost Rastafarian. It's what? Mm -hmm. it's Rast Rastafarian. Rastafarian? Rastafarian, did you say? Yeah, because they don't they don't refer to anything as anything else but i and so if, we're, if i was talking to you robert it would be not bob and robert it would be i and i we're yeah. all one okay. of the same and so maybe similar. it goes something like that yeah I think also, it also goes to uh, it also goes to the way he he narrates it's like a kaleidoscope of narration it goes around you don't, you don't quite know who is the narrator and then uh, there's there's a movie of it, uh, The Sound and the Fury, James Franco. And and he did another one, which we watched last night, called As I Lay Dying, uh, on another Faulkner novel. Very unusual film, but in a way brilliant. Uh, did they pull off the Faulkner strangeness? They, somehow they met, he, he captured it, it, it as impossible in a way as it is but through, through the medium of uh, moving pictures, but he, he, uh, he does a good, you know, comes close. It's yeah. very, very interesting. And as you might guess, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it's hard to follow the movie as well in, in the same way that you, uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, uh, we're linear thinkers. No, yeah. Yeah. And a movie is presented from start to finish, too. Did you I see guess it, it, Peter? No, I didn't even know there was a movie. Um, yeah. I can't imagine how they would do that. I really yeah. can't. Yeah. Probably like 2001. Mm, and you maybe. said with James Franco? James Franco is actually, yeah, he's, he's underappreciated. He was... Yeah, he's, he was good, very, very good. He directed and acted in it. And uh, both I films. As a, I have to look that up. Yeah. I don't have a whole lot of other things to do right now. <laughs> right. That's, <laughs> that's, why, that's why we were watching Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis TV right. shows yeah. from the 50s. They yeah. were actually really good, weren't they? They were. <laughs> they, oh, it's they not something, it's something you can't binge watch it because 
they're too redundant. You know, that the same scenarios always, this fairly straight guy and then this nutty guy comes in who messes everything up. And Robert, have you ever the seen the scene where Jerry Lewis is in the same room with a fairman? No. You can probably just look that up. It's I'm sure it's up there. Just look, type in Jerry Lewis. Jerry Theremin. Lewis Theremin, okay. He goes into this room and the theremin, and he walks by it and it goes, woo. <laughs> <laughs> then he starts to play it. He was actually a really good musician when he was young. Yes, when he would conduct the orchestra and everything, it was just hilarious. I saw him play drums against Buddy Rich and he kept yep. right up. Wow. Yes. Not as flashy, but you know, he kept up. And the other surprising thing is that Dean Martin could actually dance. He could. Well, he was like a song and dance man originally. Yeah. 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 And that's where it all was, too. Is it was all a lot of it started with, you know, Broadway. And so the perform the performer, the performing actor could do everything and yeah. had to do everything, you know, because they were competing against a lot of other aspiring actors. So you had to dance, sing and have the acting presence to pull it and all off. Too. And maybe sing also, right? Oh yeah, all that. Hitters, right? That's what they are. It was. I mean, that's the art of theater. It's the uh, the Wagner, the Gesamtkunstwerk. You know, it's all the ultimate combination of the arts. Yeah. Well, I guess it started with opera. I guess, I don't know. There's maybe not as much dancing in opera. There's ballroom dancing. Well, it depends on what country you were from. Because in Paris, they couldn't have an opera that didn't have a ballet in it. And in right. Germany, you couldn't have an opera that had a ballet in it. So... <laughs> Well, Mozart was stuck, just totally stuck. <laughs> yeah. There's that scene in Amadeus where the ballet is to no music. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, there's also the, the orchestra on stage in Marriage of, uh, in Don Giovanni. Uh, right, right. Yeah. At the ending where everything yeah, goes yeah, hell and yeah, the emperor yeah, falls asleep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, in Amadeus, no, and the actual opera. There's the, but anyway, um, we have a, a my a friend from years ago, Justinian Tamasuza from Uganda, and we hope to have him on the podcast at some point. Although the, getting the internet over there is difficult, but he may send us a kind of pre-made uh, film, uh, and then we could play some of his just some things on YouTube. But he. Uh, always talked about how their department of their arts departments, so let's say, did not have any divisions between music, art, dance, theater. It's it was all one. Uh, they they all melded together and and uh, Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, out of that tradition. Right. So, right. Yeah, it opens for collaboration too. Um, yeah. But the Greeks had all the medicine and music which should have been tossed into that mixture also. Yeah. Greeks, Sorry, say that again. The Greeks thought that medicine and religion, I, I said music, medicine and religion should be tox, tossed into that same mix, that it was all mm -hmm. part of the same one same thing. And gymnastics. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I was never... Well, wasn't it. mathematics and music, wasn't, there, wasn't that, that the two pillars of... The Greek, right, and then and religion, yeah. and religion, yeah, yeah. Peter, uh, uh, or let let's ask uh, Bob and Mike about. Uh, let's have one more of their collaboration before we sign off. A lot of tough choices. Um, yeah, we have a beautiful day for a bombing, which we've already kind of talked a bit about, and then we have um, Pasacalia, which we've only just mentioned, but um, would either of you have a preference uh, for which we'd see and hear? Well, I would tell you that there's a lot of magic in the Pasacalia um, from Mike's point. And Mike yeah. got that spot on and had no idea. He was operating completely in the dark blind and, and made this great piece out of smoke, which is what the piece <laughs> is about. Uh -huh. Guy burning in Vietnam. Right? So, okay. uh, that sounds like a good one to, to go out with. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We can do that. Uh, tell me a bit about that while I get that queued up. Um, Bob, you go ahead and start. Tell me how you created it, what your choices meant. I will, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it over to Mike because Mike's the one who made this piece really work. Uh, I was in Vietnam, and we came under, a, a, under attack, and at the same time, we were trying to burn off this really thick grass, which was hiding 
the enemy from us. And so we lit the grass on fire, but the guy was standing right behind me. Um, his gas can blew up. We were pouring gasoline in the grass and it blew up right in his hands and it created a wall of fire and behind me. In front of me were three, three uh, barbed wire fences surrounding me in a U-shaped form, you know, barbed wire fences. So I had to run out through that wall of fire and I didn't know that the guy was still in there. So I ran through the wall of fire and then I saw that my friend was still struggling in the fire itself. And I ran in to get him to pull him out and we then came under fire from the enemy at the same time. And I pulled him out, but he didn't make it. Uh. The music came from, I was inspired by Hans Zimmer of all people, uh, the film composer. And uh, I just thought, well, you know, I think I should write a reverential piece for organ and what better form to use than a Pasacalia for organ, right? <laughs> wow. like, it follows most of the rules. Uh, but then it started to become, it did, like good pieces, it started to take a life of its own, like the distortion that I added into it and all doesn't, you don't find that in Bach Pasacalias and the strange multiple, multiple rhythms at the end. It's really in polyrhythmic at the end. It's a five, eight in one tempo versus four, I think in another tempo, which, you know, that would be a Elliot Carter inspired kind of thing. It doesn't sound like that, but it's the same technique. Yeah. So then I handed the CD of this organ music to Mike and said, go, here, Merry Christmas. <laughs> uh, Merry Christmas. Uh, did he yeah. ever? I believe did you did have a title, though. It, I think it just said Pastor Collier. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, which at the did, time, I had no idea what that meant, so. <laughs> uh -huh. So you, and then did you, like uh, you described uh, in the um, Cosmos genome, did you have or another piece, did you have multiple drafts before you settled on what seemed to work best? Yeah, I did as well. The first version was more colorful um, because I was using uh, some watercolor paintings as my basis for the imagery. Um, but somehow, you know, when I got to that more, the grayish black and white, it, it seemed more appropriate. Uh, that, so. And deep at the same time. I went, yeah, so I went with that version instead. Mm -hmm. so I asked Mike over the years if we could just drop in a little blood every once in a while, a little <laughs> drop of red here and there. And, and Mike said, well, you know, that's really hard to do. <laughs> and then someone, it was again, it was Don Womack, and he said, you need one more note at the end. Typical oh. composition teaching, right? <laughs> oh. And I went and tried to add it in, but I couldn't because it made it too long. And because it, it didn't line up with Mike's, Mike's visuals anymore. My uh, limit that the piece had to be 11 minutes and 30 seconds and no more or something. <laughs> yeah, I think the length was determined by if it was all finished. You know, yeah. the those were all there. So I couldn't add one more doot at the end. That's all it needs. So what, I, what you'll have to do is you unmute your mic and you do that for us live and we'll consider yeah. that part of our live performance today, I, Bob. I, I can't tell you, we, you guys have, per, have aired that several times or performed yeah. it a few times. Yeah. You know, at, at various uh, venues, and at the end, I'm always wanting to go, do. <laughs> <laughs> but also, you got to handle the volume controls at the Imaginarians. My record. I wanted to talk about that too. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Were there complaints about that? No, no. <laughs> That's part of the experience. <laughs> you need to be cranked up at that spot. <laughs> I was just saying, no, at but Steve Loa, they had those 18-inch subwoofers <laughs> and thousands of watts. Oh. Of they shake. They shake. Yeah. yeah. You know, you would love the sound system, Bob, at the uh, Maui Ocean Center um, facility where we're trying to put it, where we had committed to a show, but we've been, uh, you know, furloughed from that temporarily. They have a really unique acoustic environment. They have um, hard walls for the dome. And so the acoustic right. presence, you, you know, you could be 40 feet away from somebody and whisper, and it's like they're standing right next to you. It is the strangest thing. Strange. It makes for a quieter audience. Yeah, and it also makes for a really different kind of uh, auditory experience with the sounds because the the video the the film that they play is like a fifteen minute three dimensional uh, you know very artistic kind of underwater whale video with such incredibly powerful low tones that it, it just vibrates from the ground to the ceiling. It's really really fantastic. That's really really great. Years ago, I thought about doing a piece there 
before they had the dome, but it would have been a piece more like you would walk through the music as you walked through their tunnels, those glass tunnels that they have to go through the aquariums, right? You would walk through and there would be live players stationed throughout the place and it would all be synchronized to a point and you would have this experience while moving uh, and the music, music stays stationary instead. And of course there's fish swimming all around you, right? And Let's I do that. That's, that would be that's blue, great. You know, the blue color and everything. Yeah. <laughs> It's, cool. it's an interesting idea. It's very good, and I think we should do it. Well, maybe there'll be some way that we could incorporate that as a an all around experience for the audience, as they have to enter through the shark tunnel, experience that musical. Uh, I mean, it'd be kind of like uh, I mean, we talk about it all the time, Robert. But the um, uh, Verez at the uh, World's Fair, you know, yeah, like Zanakis designed and Le Corbusier designed that space with 400 something loudspeakers. And as the audience moved around, the poem electronique would sound different from all these different, you know, tape channels. Mm -hmm. That's very, very cool. I'd like to hear that though. Yeah, that'd be really neat. Well, mm -hmm. um, anything else you guys want to say about uh, Pasacalia? I mean, uh, Bob, I, I, that's a really intense story. I, I can only imagine that um, it probably evokes a very haunting memory for you. So I appreciate you sharing that. Oh, sure. No, to me now, it's, um, I listen to it. That's just me playing organ and I feel, oh, I should have had a little bit different performance values here. <laughs> Robert, you'll appreciate that. You know. <laughs> but it is what it is. You know. <coughs> is, is this uh, musical work something that's been performed outside of um, this collaboration? Um, it's, been, it's been performed, not performed, it's been played on the radio a few times. Oh, wow. I, what I like to do is, is it, most of it's notated. It's not all, but it would be really easy to finish that up um, and give it to a really great church organist of some sort with a big cathedral. You know, somebody like, uh, what is her name? Uh, someone who can play Messi on. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, that, of that, that guy yeah. up in Maluhia, Robert, with the organ built into his yeah. home, he's not yeah. still doing concerts or is he? Oh, no, he's long gone long gone oh sold the organ sold he had a beautiful steinway b piano sold that house everything wow we haven't been in touch for years oh. james warren his name was james guess, warren that's right if is, i had to have a name. parting remark about the pasacalia it would be that i'm still astonished to this very moment about what mike did it just blows me away Mike. oh thank you thank you well, I've been your fan for a long time. Okay, well, <laughs> that's why we're all here right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really excited to, to check it out, especially uh, the way that this collaboration works. Um, we're going to go ahead and give it a listen and a watch. Pasacalia.
God. Good job there, Bob. Finishing that, I was I was yeah, waiting yeah, for that. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't resist. <laughs> just what it needed. Just what it needed. <laughs> yeah. So wow. I was just curious. It sounded a little dis kind of distorted, and maybe it was just on my end here. You might want to check the audio of the playback on that part. I will. I will. Yeah, I'll listen again to it and make sure that it's uh, bears the integrity of the original. And if if I feel that it doesn't, then I'll just overlay the um, original the original file over right, top right, of right. it. Yeah, that's cool. Very cool. It's very cool. So, yeah. what an effort! I mean, both a very intense musical soundscape and uh, Mike the the black and white lens. It almost reminded me of like chemogram type of photography development. I'm sure that uh, Gwen has talked to you a bit about that kind of stuff. I know she's into it. Gwen Arkin, you know, over at the college. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, those, those are um, watercolor paintings. Are they? Wow. Wow. Yeah. And then you, you just preserve them in black and white. I mean, you, you turn it digitally into black and white. No, I mean, they were originally that. Oh, they uh, were black. Yeah. Black and white. Yeah. Oh. Peter, you had uh, shown us some of Zanaki's work where he uh, graphically notates with shapes and, and then the, the music follows that, responds to the graphic shapes and it flows just the way this piece flows, that there's a kind of scrolling across, like a musical score almost. Right, like reading a score. Reading a score, yeah, it has that. And then, you, uh, Michael, you said it became black and white. It, do you feel like that was because, in part, there was the one instrumental color, basically, and it, it didn't change colors of instruments? or Probably, yeah. Uh -huh. Probably a good reason why. Yeah. Instead of having a bunch of different colors coming right. through, which was kind of my original intention. Well, I, uh -huh. I think, Robert, I, I think you'd agree, that piece is fairly monochromatic from a sonic perspective. Right. So, that's what you're saying, I think, because yeah. it's all the organ. And it's, but it's yeah. also the same style and the rhythm and yeah. you know, all that stuff is all pretty common all throughout, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like regular music used to be. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, it's, it reminds me of, you know, a lot of the minimalism of, you know, like the 60s, like sort of a, a Terry Riley, you know, a uh, Lamont Young kind of a thing too. Well, you can get into the beginning of Koyaanisqatsi in here too, if you want to. You know, oh yeah, Koyaanisqatsi, yeah. Yeah, it's not the same music, but it's the same effect. Yeah, Philip Glass did a lot of work for organ. Yeah. In fact, yeah. a lot of it is like parallel or a, um, similar motion and contrary motion and music in fifths. A lot of that was done on organ, I mean, I think. And see, he didn't get, he first got no, um, his notoriety came before all of the synthesizers did, which is what his group used and ended up playing a lot of, you know, the electronic keyboards. But his stuff started off with electric piano and piano and percussion and organ and singers, you know, all kinds of stuff. All kinds of great stuff, yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you a question, Robert. Remember yes. when notation, music notation was fun? And, and people were out, out all these really creative pieces with unique notation, like the Zanaki. Oh, yes. Yeah, the graphic notation. Yeah, there's that. And there's some, some other things were more artsy-fartsy, you know, uh -huh. with drawings and stuff. Even, yeah. even music, even Terry Riley, or maybe especially his quartets, the music for Salome that he did with the Kronos Quartet, it's got drawings all over <laughs> it, line drawings all over the music. It's just... Yeah. And, and now we do Finale instead. Right? Earl Brown. Yeah. Did a lot of that. Earl Brown, right. The David yeah. Hyman. Yeah. yeah. And that, you know, that that stopped at some point. It became it it it's it would became its own art form, really. Uh, maybe veering away from the original source of the, 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 being the music, but um it you know, the beauty of the just the visual beauty of it was right. Lou Harrison was into doing that. Oh, uh, uh, he was. I mean, the Gamelon music of his, if you look at the scores, there's drawings all over the place mm. in, in there. But, um, well. Well, you're right. The drawings are themselves a form of notation. Yeah. And but I think what happened actually, though, is called digital notation software. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, you because you can't write music like that. You can't write. You couldn't write like an early Penderecki piece. That's another good example of the scores yeah. being really creative. You can't. Maybe write one of the first now. examples. Right. right, but it wouldn't work in any of the digital transcription formats that we know of. You'd have to draw it in a drawing program. Hmm. You would. Well, so I guess what you could do is you could you could lay it all out in say finale and then you'd copy it into Photoshop and then you'd, you know, mark it all in. I mean, I'd like to see what, what maybe Mike could come up with if we gave you a bunch of empty staves and then you, you paint on them and then we submit that to some musicians. Right. Yeah, we, we've done something time. like that. Yeah. There was one event where Mike, you did a kind of almost finger painting on a, on a uh, iPad. That oh, that's projected. Right. Yeah. Which was very effective effective for us also eliminated the need of, to make a big mess with all the paint and everything else but it, it, it was uh something along those lines it was wasn't a digital it? painting on digital one painting yeah yeah uh well that's right so you were painting live and the musicians were reacting to the choices you were making they were interpreting that uh musically and vice versa too vice versa yeah. oh yeah wow I mean, remember when yeah. we would do those things with uh, yeah. uh, Emil Richards, and we would right. have and live Piero, Piero and Piero. Tony Wallham. Yeah, yeah, we still have them in our living room. Oh. You know, Robert. Years <laughs> before I met you, years and years and years, um, Emil Richards. I was one of his biggest fans in L.A. Yeah. You know, in the movie score and in, in movie industry. I got his book, the one that has a collection of all his great instruments. And mm -hmm. I started trying to make some of them, and I realized there was more to it than that. <laughs> yeah. Was that, uh, were those the, not the instructional video for, for uh, uh, books for um, like a classroom situation? You no, mean, it was a collection of beyond percussion instruments. Was it by, uh, based on Parch or? Uh, mm, it was no. based on his, on, his? on Amel's instrument collection. Because he, he, he housed the Parch, Did he? Parch instruments, yeah. For many years, he he uh, put him up for months and months and uh, in their home and um, well, yeah, what they happened had quite to that a, collection? That went to a museum. I think it's at the Smithsonian. Is it? it I I thought the parts okay. instruments were there, but I could be wrong. Maybe just some of them are there, or maybe I'm misremembering. Or somewhere, uh, Oklahoma or some museum. Yeah. But you may be right, Peter. But yeah, yeah Emil Richards, who we we lost, um, he passed away about what a year ago. Or so, so was Emil a protege of Harry Parch? Uh, or of a fan, maybe? A fan, more uh, maybe, yeah. and a follower and an admirer of the, of the instruments. Well, the instruments were fabulous, but Parch also had a really pretty profound philosophy too, you know, behind all of that, and nothing. Oh that yeah tuned and industrial tuning sounded good to him. His mm. Genesis of, of a Music is an incredible book. One of the only books I system. kept when I moved back over here. <laughs> I, I hope it's still in print. I haven't looked for it in a while. Um, it turns out actually, Robert, that in 2014, all of his instruments were moved to the University of Washington in Seattle under the care okay. of Charles Corey. So they've been there oh. for six years. Okay. Cool. cool. Well, yeah. they belong on the West Coast. <laughs> yeah, it's a West Coast kind of thing. Well, you know, wasn't he a... Uh, like a boxcar hobo for a number of years in California. Was, yeah, the, my favorite piece of his is called Barstow. Yeah. <laughs> and it's all of the, the graffiti he found under a bridge while waiting for a ride, for thumbing a ride out mm. there in the desert. Like day one, no rides. You know, you guys know that piece, right? Yeah. <laughs> Mike, Mike, I don't know if you're familiar with Harry Parch, but it, he's yeah, a right. trip, man. He's a trip. Yeah. He created his, his own tuning system. His, he built his own instruments. And he recruited his own ensemble of very unique and talented musicians to perform it. And he himself, you know, was perhaps one of the greatest eccentric geniuses of music, you know, in the 20th century. Just yeah. what he did was wholly unique. Awesome. It's We're not always listenable. <laughs> it was also very Greek, too. It sounds real Greek-like, like old Greek music. You know? Yeah, his pacing and his, his cadence and rhythm, it's very Might be trudging along. So Mike, you'd like you'd appreciate him just because the instruments are really beautiful. Like he has this cloud chamber, I don't know what we call it, a gong. It's made out of all these semi-glass bowls that are big and suspended, and you bang up, hit them with mallets, but they're different sizes. Huh. Yeah, uh, Mike, check it out on my screen here. That's the cloud chamber. Yeah, wow. very cool. 
Is yeah. that not cool? That is great. Let me see what else he's got. He's got some uh, adapted piano or, or harpsichord somehow. So he'd retune and relabel everything. And everything that he did was designed in, in ratios. So if you see on the instruments, he's got five over three and one over one and, um, you know, ratios marked because those were the uh, harmonic ratios. Hmm. Right. Of the fifths versus the roots. And again, because the fifths are naturally out of tune. So he had to develop his own system for <laughs> tuning and notation and... Um, how many strings I had a, on that? Yeah, so. I had a friend who played an adapted viola in his ensemble at some point in the 60s, I think, but I'm, wow. I'm not sure when. I've never been able to find any pictures of it, but. Neat. Very cool. That's we something special. We need more people who do stuff like that now. I mean, mm. like, <laughs> what the heck? I, isn't there a, a place in ebb and flow art for some create, creative genius composer who makes his own instruments? <laughs> yeah, I think, I, should, I think it's, it's so expensive to live these days you know how would we have the time to create something like this I mean that's <laughs> wow well it, you know a lot of that stuff is found it's, art uh, it's found yeah. stuff you know like the nose cone mm. incredible I mean, stuff even looking, looking at them sculpturally I mean they're just really beautiful pieces yes, yes. Right, yeah. right just the woodwork alone yeah Yeah, absolutely worth revisiting. It makes you want to listen to his like, stuff go look right him now. Up on YouTube and listen to some of it. You'll be amazed. Yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> who's Harry Parch? listening, Harry Parch. Parch, Harry Parch, G A R T C H. Yeah, I wish I wish I could experience Harry Parch for the first time. You know how when you when you read a book or a movie for the first time, it has a profound impact. Um, Harry Parch was was like that for me because I was maybe twenty when I first became acquainted with his music and it, I found it to be so bizarre that it fascinated me more than anything else. You know, how is this possible and how does, how does this guy operate, you know, mentally to even, to even conceive of this kind of stuff. While all the electronic music was being put together. All the new instruments were being designed. People were building all the Moogs, you know, and all of that. that. And he was building this stuff. <laughs> Definitely followed his own drummer. Mm. Mike, uh, Mike, take a look at the, take a look at this piece right here. I'll put it up. You know, it's some kind of an ad adapted marimba. Wow. wow. Yeah, but the tunings are way, way out there. Like the tuning on the diamond. Uh, it, he was also um, inspired by the uh, by African balafon tunings. Mm -hmm. So we, once again, like Steve Reich, we get into this world world music sourcing kind of. I think I think he prefers it pronounced Reich as opposed to Reich, or am I wrong about that? One of the, one of them is taboo. <laughs> well, which one would it be if you were? I, I don't know. <laughs> is he still is he still um, active? Um, is I'm he? Not, they just celebrated his birthday recently. I, oh, that's always a big to do, I'm sure. But um, he was was he one of the founders of the Zadik record label over in New York? I don't, I don't know, but he was definitely a founder of minimalism. Yeah. Yeah. One of his uh, associates, uh, Mark Dresser, you know, we wanted oh, to get him on the show. Yeah. He was, I think he was produced under his label. But Mark is a be great wrong. punk art basis. Yeah. He came to Maui and, and performed with Ebb and Flow and he's one of our hopeful right. guests really that we'd have good. at some point in the future. I, he came to the Contrabass festivals that they used to yes. have. Yes. Really, really good. That's nice. how we got we brought him to Maui because yeah. he was there under the Contrabass Festival auspices in Honolulu. Right. right, right. Which she would bring in the best basses from all Yeah, over. yeah, that was exciting. She brought in, you know, Victor Wooten, but she also brought in um the grand old man. What is his name? Why am I losing? <laughs> um uh, uh, yeah, 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 geez. How can how come um his name escapes me now. Mine too, uh, but he, he offered my son bass lessons in France for free. Wow. He wanted to take him under his wing. Aaron's really a great bass player. Uh -huh. uh, and um, all set up, it didn't work out, but he made the offer, which is really great. Huh. But you know, I mean. Yeah, we, as a matter of fact, I accompanied him in a concert of, at the bass, and I now can't think of his name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, it'll come to you uh, as soon as we sign off. Yeah, sure. But um, 
Famico Wellington, who organizes now on our uh, Ebb and Flow board. Is she? Yeah. Did you so, know her father? No. Sure. I knew, we knew of him, but not. He passed just before you, I met uh -huh. you, just before you got here. Uh -huh. is, is she still doing that? No. No. No, that, that ended many years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Is Francois that? Rabat. Francois Rabat. Francois Rabat. Rabat. Yep. Exactly right. Thank you. Yeah. I was going to get it, and, and, and then I was going to email you the answer. <laughs> yeah, but if you wanted to study with a famous bass teacher, that would be the one. That would be the one. Yeah. That would so, be it. Yeah. But um, uh, can I ask you, how long do you edit this down to? <laughs> I, I don't. I I present it pretty unedited. I think it's it's such a great conversation that there would be no point in editing anything out of it, you know. Do you know when it'll be up? Okay. A couple of days, I think. So it should be, uh, today's the 15th, probably by the 18th or 19th, we should be able to listen to it. So we send a, an email out with a link and then we post it on our website and we post it on YouTube. And... Um, yeah, we try to make it available in a couple of different formats. And at the same time, I also want to include uh, links to work by each of you so that audiences yeah. can research a little bit further too. So um, they can kind of see what you're up to and, and what you're bringing to the table now and in the future and, cool. you know, stay in touch too. Awesome. There's stuff on the table. Yeah. There is stuff on the table. Well, we can't wait to hear and experience more of it. Hopefully, um, this new renaissance that we're birthing at the moment um, can lead to something really <laughs> incredible globally. I mean, I, I know that's where we're headed. It is possible yeah. that by the time we're actually allowed to put these out in public again, Mike and I will have done another one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we, we, we're we so, so grateful for the work that you've done over the years. It's been a really the heart and soul of uh, along with Peter's work uh, of music of the spheres. It's just the, the thread through all those programs that has kept it strong. It's a very viable concept. Obviously it's existed since the mid eighties, but uh, it's been such a great thing to have your talents as part of our ebb and flow productions. And now to have this uh, in-depth discussion is um, a great addition. And um, we will wish you well um, in your work in good health uh, and um, continuing on um, as you are. It, it's very important and vital that you do so. Um, so thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank, thank you, you, Peter. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Bob. Really, really appreciate knowing both of you and really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to have this great conversation. And uh, like I said, we'll post links and we'll keep in touch and I hope we have a chance to do this again. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. We'll see All you, right. Bob. Okay. Bye. All Bye, right. Everybody. Aloha, everybody.